On this edition for Saturday, May 19th, millions tune in to watch the wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. Still searching for answers after the mass shooting in Santa Fe, Texas. And in our signature segment, Inside Yemen, food being used as a weapon of war. Next on PBS NewsHour Weekend. PBS NewsHour Weekend is made possible by Bernard and Irene Schwartz, the Cheryl and Philip Milstein family, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, Dr. P. Roy Vagelos and Diana T. Vagelos, the JPB Foundation, the Anderson Family Fund, Rosalind P. Walter, Barbara Hope Zuckerberg. Corporate funding is provided by Mutual of America, designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company. Additional support has been provided by and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. From the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center in New York, Allison Stewart. Good evening and thank you for joining us. As victims of the Santa Fe High School shooting in Southeast Texas recover in local hospitals and families and friends mourn the death of eight students and two teachers, authorities continue to investigate what is now the fifth deadliest school shooting in the U.S. since the Columbine killings in 1999. Late last night, 17-year-old Demetrius Pagorchis, a student at the high school, confessed to the shooting. In an affidavit, he said he chose his targets and he did not shoot students he liked so he could, quote, have his story told. Pagorchis was charged with capital murder and aggravated assault on a public servant. Texas Governor Greg Abbott said Pagorchis used his father's shotgun and 38 caliber pistol, and explosive devices were found in and near the school. At a press conference today, officials said schools will be closed Monday and Tuesday and express the community's grief. Arts cannot express the sorrow in our hearts today as we continue to mourn for those we have lost and those who need our support emotionally, spiritually, and physically. The names of those killed are now being reported, among them a substitute teacher, an exchange student from Pakistan, and students as young as 15. In a ceremony watched around the world, Britain's Prince Harry and American Meghan Markle were married today at Windsor Castle. Their official titles are now Duke and Duchess of Sussex. 600 guests joined the royal family, including Sir Elton John, who performed at one of the receptions, Oprah Winfrey, British actor Idris Elba, human rights attorney Amal Clooney and her husband George Clooney, soccer player David Beckham and Spice Girl singer Victoria Beckham, the bride's friends, actress Priyanka Chopra and tennis star Serena Williams, as well as Markle's co-stars from the TV show Suits. Prince Harry's grandparents, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip, both in their 90s, were greeted with cheers from the crowds outside the chapel. The bride and her mother, Doria Raglan, rode to the castle together in one of the Queen's Rolls Royces. The bride's dress, kept a secret until this morning, was white silk with a 16-foot hand-embroidered veil designed by Claire Waite Keller of the fashion house Givenchy. Her diamond bandeau tiara was on loan from the Queen's collection. Harry's father, Prince Charles, walked Markle down the aisle. Prince Harry's best man, his brother Prince William, stood by his side. A variety of music marked the event. Meghan Markle personally invited Sheku Kani Mason, a 19-year-old cellist and student at the Royal Academy of Music, who played several classical pieces, including Ave Maria. And a British gospel group performed Benny King's classic, Stand By Me. Stand by me, stand by me. To have and to hold. The couple exchanged vows and rings, Harry breaking with British aristocratic tradition by choosing to wear a band, unlike his grandfather and brother. The couple emerged from the chapel and kissed at the top of the stairs before riding through the streets of Windsor in a horse-drawn carriage. The crowds, estimated at 100,000 people, cheered, snapped photos, and waved flags. Before the couple exchanged vows, the presiding bishop of the American Episcopal Church, the Most Reverend Michael Curry, delivered a sermon on love, quoting the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. We must discover the power of love, the redemptive power of love. And when we do that, we will make of this old world a new world, for love 
Love is the only way. There's power in love. Joining me now via Skype from the United Kingdom is the most reverend Michael Curry. Reverend, thanks for being with us. Sure, glad to be with you. Your message to this couple today was about the power of love, but there was definitely a message for the rest of the world as well. What do you hope we all took away from today's ceremony? Well, you know, I really do hope and pray that, that, that this day can be a day of renewal um, for all of us. Um, and there was a couple who are deeply in love with each other and you could feel and see their love on their faces um, and it's real. Um, and, and they chose the text that I used from the Song of Solomon. And it's just interesting that it comes from a part in that um, the Song of Solomon or Song of Songs is really a love poem found in the Hebrew scriptures, uh, the Old Testament. And, and so that text actually became the springboard for recognizing that the love between Harry and Meghan, between this couple, actually was tapping into a greater love that isn't a matter of sentimentality, but actually is a way of life that can change lives and that can change social structures and can change the world and the way in which we live. And we need that right now. Yeah, yeah, we do. You, your name and, and your sermon immediately became popular on Twitter. Your name started trending immediately and people were tweeting things like, we are having church and preach it, pastor. Um, I'm a black Episcopalian, so I obviously, I recognize uh, you bring some of the traditions of the black church to this very formal royal ceremony. Tell us a little bit about your thought process there. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. I, I, I realized that um, they were, uh, the, the couple really uh, created a service that was very much steeped in the tradition. I mean, the service followed the tradition of the Church of England here. Um, using uh, various uh, prayer books that they use here. And so it was very traditional in that respect, and yet they wove together many different worlds. And so you had the wonderful choir um, from St. George's Chapel. You had the gospel choir singing. You had the celloist. You had different worlds of music um, that were being used in the course of the service of worship. What did this wedding signal about inclusiveness? Well, I, I think it really does um, signal in many respects because, because the royal couple bring together many different worlds, um, both in terms of ethnicity, in terms of nationality, um, in terms of just various kinds of in their ingredients in the backgrounds of their lives. They bring a variety of worlds together. When, when the first chapter of Genesis says that the, the man and woman have been placed there um, to, to not have dominion in terms of conquering, but in terms of being stewards, caring for the creation, caring for the world. That part of God's reason for putting us here was not only to care for the world in terms of the creation itself, but to care for each other. And when we do that, we find that we're on a path of life that actually works. Reverend Curry, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. God bless you. See more photos from the royal wedding. Visit pbs.org slash newshour. We turn now to our ongoing series of reports inside Yemen. The civil war that has raged there since 2015 shows no signs of letting up as the international community struggles to find a workable peace plan. Caught in the crossfire are Yemeni civilians. 75% of whom require humanitarian assistance every day just to survive. And as special correspondent Marsha Biggs reports, food itself has become a weapon of war. The story was produced in partnership with the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting and a warning, this piece contains some graphic images. In this pediatric ward in Aden, every room tells a version of the same story. 11-month-old Malika al Khadr clinging to life Weighing only seven pounds, she's just one of the 17 million Yemenis who aren't getting enough food to survive. We only eat one meal a day, her mom tells me. We fled from Mocha three months ago and we're living in a camp. Is there food in the camp? There's only rice, tomato sauce and a little bit of wheat, she says, and I'm breastfeeding. When did your baby become sick? Malika can't get the nutrients she needs because her mother doesn't have enough food. 
Malika is half the weight she should be at 11 months old. Her immune system vulnerable, she contracted measles and went into sepsis. She can die from hypothermia. Her doctor Aida El Sadiq says these are complications that arise from malnutrition. Others can include chest infections and meningitis. All can prove fatal. How often do you see these cases? From 30 to 40 monthly. 30 to 40 malnourished yeah. children per yeah. month. Severely. Severely acute malnour malnourished, complicated malnourished, not, not uh, uh, merely malnourished. Who do you blame? Or what do you blame? The war. The war. First of all, stop the war. The beauty of Yemen's landscape belies a society that has always suffered. It was the poorest country in the region before the war, and now it's the scene of what's being called the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. It began in 2014 when Houthi rebels opposing Yemeni government corruption took over huge parts of the country. The Houthis are a predominantly Shiite sect backed by Iran. In 2015, they invaded the strategically crucial southern port city of Aden, and there was a fierce battle. The government asked Sunni Saudi Arabia for help in defending the city, which it did with aid from a coalition, including the United Arab Emirates and the United States. The coalition then drove the Houthis north, where the battle continues. Today, both sides in the conflict use food as a weapon of war. The Houthis by hiking food prices to finance their war effort, and the Saudi coalition by attempting to starve the Houthi side into submission. For two months last year, the Saudi government blockaded the Houthi-held port of Hodeida in an attempt to choke its supply lines. For a country that historically has relied on imports for 90% of its food, it was catastrophic. Amid international outcry, the Saudis eased the blockade in January. But in order to control who gets both food and fuel entering Yemen, the coalition requires some ships to be diverted to the already crowded port of Aden, which the coalition oversees. You can see the remnants behind me of Yemen's Coast Guard, which was hit so hard in 2015 in the battle with the Houthis. They're now trying to rebuild themselves, and they're in charge of securing the waters off Aden's coast. They're going to take us out to a ship, an American ship, which is carrying aid for the World Food Program. Apparently, it was quite difficult, quite a coup, to get the permissions even to dock here in Aden. But they're stuck several miles out to sea because of red tape and corruption, just waiting for a parking space. All these ships are waiting. All the ships, yeah. Our guide for the day is Marwan El Bakshi. His unit is assigned to watch over the ships that are waiting for permission from the coalition to dock. What's the longest one of these boats has waited out here? Some of the ships, they are waiting for 20 days. For 20 days? Yes. Three weeks some of the ships have waited. Yes. Is it hard for you as a Yemeni? Of course, yeah. To really? see that this food is yes. stuck at uh, 15 nautical miles outside? I'm really, I'm really feeling sad about that. Yeah, but I, but I have no authority to do what I can do. My job is to protect her. This is food for the Yemeni people. They need it. It's too important. The ship sat offshore for five days. Then finally, it arrived here at the port of Aden's mill, where the grain on board was offloaded and will be turned into flour. The UN's World Food Program, the WFP, is on the front line in the fight to feed almost 60% of the country. Shashi Daran is the program officer in Aden, and these are the bins designated for the WFP. It's the leading source of food aid in the country, but it's still feeding less than half of the 17 million in need. We saw today the grain streaming in. So why are Yemen's people starving? We are providing food, but we are not providing food to everybody. We do not have enough funding uh, available with us. Even if they had the funding, getting the food to the people living on front lines is almost impossible due to constant fighting. And there are hurdles too in getting the food to the rest of those in need. Without proper clearances, aid organizations run the risk of their trucks being bombed. There's a long procedure of getting the clearances and informing the local authorities and the security belt forces that our trucks are moving this and it needs to move in those specific times because if it doesn't move in those specific times, it could be at the wrong time, at the wrong place, or accidentally being um, attacked. How tough is that red tape to get through? <sighs> Sometimes uh, just uh, to get a couple of trucks, it could take five to six days a delay, which means... Delayed five to six days. Yeah. Let's say if the food was supposed to reach on the 10th, it is leaving from here on the 15th, 
by the time it reaches the people, the end of the month, the whole month, they have gone uh, hungry. If you are delayed because the ship's out at sea, then you already start delayed. Yeah, so it's exactly. delay upon it's delay. It's like a firefighting uh, exercise on a daily basis. A looming fuel crisis caused in part by the blockade also means trucks don't run consistently. The problem is that sometimes we don't have fuel, Muhammad Ali Saleh tells me. Sometimes I have to stop driving the truck for three or four days. Even during the fighting, it wasn't this bad. Uh, we can show you the food basket that is provided. The final destination is a distribution site like this one, just outside of Aden, where people wait in line all day to receive monthly rations. Ashwak Saif says she walked two hours with painful kidney stones to get here to bring food home for her five children. My husband is a day laborer in construction, and we can barely afford to have food for both lunch and dinner. If we waited for him to finish work to pick up the food, we wouldn't eat today. The food we are receiving is not enough. Once we run out, we have to buy little portions with small bills to get through the month. I had to borrow 500 rial to hire a motorcycle to carry the food home for me. She tied these two coins to her scarf so as not to lose them. She says it's all she has. We are very poor. If one of the kids gets sick, we can't afford to take him to the hospital. This is a sample of the food basket that we are providing to the household in this area. Tumna Obeid is with Field Medical Foundation, a local organization funded by WFP. So sugar, lentils, wheat and oil. So the most essential commodities to survive. No, fruit or vegetables. Uh, what? <laughs> no, unfortunately. Yeah. Unfortunately. This is what we can provide them for now. I mean, it's, we are trying to save lives. More internally displaced people are coming because of the conflict on the borderline. And they are coming and asking for food assistance. Unfortunately, our resources is limited. So we only can provide a limited number. We cannot keep up. So are they on and not everyone can make it to one of these sites. We joined doctors supported by Save the Children in Lahish province, north of Aden, where they went to check on baby Abdullah, who's been malnourished for most of his short life. His mother Hatima and father Abdul Ahmed say they're poor. They can't afford food and medications. Abdullah's chubby cheeks mask stunted growth in his arms and legs, and he's battling a chest infection. So he has gained a pound in the last four weeks. Uh, but he's still tiny. This child is seven months old. While any improvement is welcome, doctors are still concerned about his overall health. He's got a bad cough and he still looks malnourished. They measure his arms to check his status. Severe acute malnutrition. Severe acute malnutrition. A concept so commonplace in Yemen that it's known by its acronym, SAM. And back in Aden, we thought we might be witnessing little Malika's final hours. Are you worried this baby isn't going to make it? Her chance to, to survive is very low. It's a painful situation. We have been uh, passing through a painful situation since years. We are losing life. Twelve days after we left the hospital, we learned that Malika defied the odds and was stabilized enough to go back to the camp. But doctors tell me she's almost certain not to get enough food there to survive. With thousands of people in Puerto Rico still without electricity, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is leaving the island. It's been eight months since Hurricane Maria wiped out homes and took down much of Puerto Rico's power grid. FEMA will leave generators in place, but with hurricane season about to begin again, residents are not confident that their local power company, which is bankrupt, will be able to restore power in the event of another storm. Joining us now is Reuters reporter Jessica Resnick-Alt, who is covering this story. Jessica, why is the Army Corps of Engineers leaving? So the Army Corps' mission was uh, assigned by FEMA, and it ended effective Friday. Right now, they're in the middle of what they've called an orderly transition to help the local power company called PREPA, the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority, mm -hmm. take over the job of finishing the restoration and then hardening the system, preparing it so that it's more resilient in the future. Jessica, how long were the Army Corps of Engineers on the ground and what did they do during that time? So the Army Corps was brought in about a week after the storm hit. First of all, they had to secure materials. 
PREPA because it was bankrupt and because of some of the administrative difficulties they had had as an entity, did not have a lot of backup materials on hand. So the Army Corps had to do uh, a number of subcontracts to get the right kind of equipment and materials on the island. That was the first thing. Then once that equipment was there, they've been helping with going around the island physically, lifting poles, lifting lines, and installing these generators, small generators that serve as backups to bring schools and police stations and other critical infrastructure online. And they've also been helping with uh, larger generators that provide supplemental power to the power plants on the island. How much of the island has power? How much doesn't? How much is in that in-between state? Right now, uh, over 98% of the island's power customers have power. So that means that about 22,000 customers or households and businesses are still without power. The in-between state is a little tricky. So I talked to some people who have solar panel systems that are temporary. They give them power during the day, but then they're unable to run their refrigerators overnight. I spoke with people who have loans for power systems like solar panels, but don't have them yet. So there are a lot of people who are sort of gradually getting energized, and it's unclear where they fall in the calculations. Even for people whose power has been restored, there have been interruptions. So last month, there was an island-wide blackout that occurred when a high-voltage line uh, was hit by an excavator that was doing some work nearby. I think there's a lot of concern that the island remains vulnerable to this season's hurricanes. Were there enough changes made in the infrastructure, which are long-lasting changes, or was it a patchwork kind of situation where the island can withstand another storm if another one comes? Hurricane season is expected to be worse than usual. It's not expected to be quite as bad as last year, but it's a pretty serious storm season that the Caribbean is bracing for. And right now, uh, I think the hope that PREPA has is that they'll have improved some of their logistical responses. They are doing uh, drills and storm response drills internally. But the reality is that at this point, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. The north side of the island, which is the more populous part with cities like San Juan, still uh, is receiving its power from the south side mm. via lines that have to cross mountains. So until those lines are buried or until there are redundant systems in the north, those cities are going to be very vulnerable to any major storm that, that sweeps through the mountains. Jessica Resnick, Alt from Reuters, thanks for sharing your reporting. Thanks for having me, Allison. This is PBS NewsHour Weekend, Saturday. First Lady Melania Trump left the hospital today, returning to the White House in what her spokesperson said were, quote, high spirits. Mrs. Trump was admitted to Walter Reed National Military Medical Center last Monday for treatment of an undisclosed kidney condition. Her lengthy hospital stay led to speculation that her treatment and condition were more serious than reported. But today in a statement, the First Lady spokesperson characterized those questions as, quote, uninformed, and said to respect Mrs. Trump's privacy, there would be no further comment. In an effort to keep the nuclear agreement with Iran in place, the European Union's Energy and Climate Commissioner met with Iran's nuclear chief in Tehran today. The EU, once the biggest importer of Iranian oil, wants to strengthen trade with Tehran. The 28-nation European Union supports France, Germany, the United Kingdom, China and Russia, signatory nations still in the agreement, despite President Trump's decision earlier this month for the United States to withdraw. Health officials confirmed three more cases of the deadly Ebola virus, this time in one of Democratic Republic of Congo's major urban centers. The World Health Organization reports 25 people have died from Ebola there since the most recent outbreak began in April. Vaccinations are expected to start early next week in the city of Mbandaka, using an experimental vaccine that successfully halted a previous Ebola outbreak in West Africa. In Alexandria, Virginia this morning, an overpass collapsed, causing a CSX cargo train to derail. 30 of the train's freight cars came off the track, stopping rail service in the area. Alexandria's fire chief said heavy rains this past week may have weakened the overpass. Train tracks crossed both above and below the structure. There were no reported injuries.
finally tonight, Cuban officials say 110 people died in Friday's plane crash in Havana, the worst crash in that country since 1989. Among them, 20 pastors from a church in the eastern region of Cuba who were returning home after attending a conference. Witnesses say they saw flames coming from the plane after takeoff and that it made a sharp turn, avoiding hitting a residential neighborhood. That's all for this edition of PBS NewsHour Weekend. I'm Allison Stewart. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. PBS NewsHour Weekend is made possible by Bernard and Irene Schwartz, the Cheryl and Philip Milstein family, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, Dr. P. Roy Vagelos and Diana T. Vagelos, the JPB Foundation, the Anderson Family Fund, Rosalind P. Walter, Barbara Hope Zuckerberg. Corporate funding is provided by Mutual of America, designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company. Additional support has been provided by and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Be more PBS.